Uh, today we're going to be in Acts chapter 14, and we'll be picking up in verse 8. We've just been really walking through the New Testament. Uh, we find ourselves in the book of Acts, and more specifically, we find ourselves in Paul's first missionary journey. Uh, Paul went through uh, several missionary journeys, but this is his first one. It's one of the shorter ones. But we've seen him uh, and Barnabas being launched out from Antioch and just going from city to city, just preaching the gospel, going to the synagogues and sharing uh, the gospel message about Christ and establishing churches as they went along. And as we get into verse 8, we're going to find uh, that they are going to, and, and verse 8 and following, we're going to find that they're going to experience Two great polar opposite experiences. And we see this happening uh, through throughout this whole missionary journey. We're getting more towards the end of it now, but we've seen it all the way through where Paul and Barnabas would go into a city, they'd teach at the synagogue, there'd be a great response to the gospel, and then opposition would arise, and oftentimes they leave the city uh, by the skin of their teeth, and uh, they have to escape. Well, here we're going to have them... At the beginning, being exalted to the status of gods, and then, in the same city, Paul nearly being stoned to death. So, they go into one city, one, uh, first off, they're being called Zeus and Hermes and being worshipped, and then they end up being stoned, or at least Paul ends up being stoned. And I think this model that we find as they go through these, these various cities, and we see the same thing happening over and over, is really just a reenactment of what happened to Christ uh, those last few days before he was crucified. Isn't that what he experienced? He went into Jerusalem. What were they doing? They were putting down palm leaves. They were worshiping him, uh, praising him. And how did he leave? Or how did it end up? Them crucifying him. And so we can see uh, a pattern with Christ being followed also here with uh, Paul and Barnabas. Not purposely, it's just the way... Uh, things had turned out. But as we get into these verses, we're going to find how it was that Paul was able to navigate both extreme polar opposite experiences. Um, how is it that Paul was able to navigate and get through an appropriate way when people were exalting him and wanting to offer sacrifices to him, but then at the same time be able to endure when people were throwing stones at him? And it's not that he had one approach for one situation and another approach for a different situation, although in, in some practical ways that might be true. But really what we find, what brought him through both circumstances was really just the fact that he had a singular focus. He was focused on one thing. And when you're focused on one thing, it can help you navigate all the various situations and circumstances you encounter. It's kind of like an anchor in a boat. Uh, Whenever you have a boat out in the water and you cast that anchor and it's down into a fixed point beneath the water, a flood can come, a drought can come, sunny weather can come, stormy weather can come, and that boat's going to remain where it was. It's going to remain fixed. And it'll keep it from wandering off and maybe being destroyed by the rapids and stuff uh, if you have a good enough anchor. Um, and so that's the same thing true with Paul. Paul had an anchor. He had a fixed point, a fixed focus that he had, and it helped him to remain anchored no matter what situations he found himself in. And you might ask, well, what was that focus that he had? Well, I think he kind of clues us in on that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. When he goes in and kind of discusses a little bit about his ministry, how the approach that he took, how he, uh, when he was preaching the gospel, when he was with the Jews, he followed all the customs of the Jews. When he was with the Gentiles, he... Uh, maybe put away some of those customs, but still, you know, maintained his morality and his commitment to Christ. But uh, he, he kind of summarized that in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians 9, where he says, I do all things for the sake of the gospel, so that I may become a fellow partaker of it. Paul was able to navigate being exalted, and he was also able to navigate through being stoned and not giving up, because he was focused on this one thing. He said, my life is all about the gospel. Wanting people to come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and the salvation that he gives. And so, 
we can see here that Paul is going to be able to navigate these two different situations because he's fixed on one thing, sharing the gospel with people. And, and this is true whether you're talking about the things of the kingdom, spiritual things, or even practical things. How is it that people can go through 10 years of medical school or whatever uh, and go through difficult times to do certain things? Oftentimes it's because they're focused, because they have a, a particular goal in mind, they have a particular drive that keeps them through and steers them through those situations. And the same thing is true with Paul, and the same thing is true with us. Uh, we too have to figure out, and figure out very soon, what is our true purpose in life? Why are we here? Why are we here? Why are we here on this planet? <coughs> And once we figure that out, once we figure out what our true purpose is while we're here, and we fix our eyes on that, and we fix our attention on that, and that becomes the one thing that we're chasing in life, that's going to help us stay committed, no matter what's going on in our lives. Financial ruin, relationship problems, uh, challenges with, with our education or with our, our job, whatever. When we have that fixed point to anchor in, it helps us to navigate and already to have some decisions made before even, uh, you know, uh, before the decision even has to be made. So hopefully as we get through and we look at this particular story, we'll be uh, encouraged to do that and it'll help us uh, in our living before the Lord. All right, so now we'll get into the actual story. In Acts chapter 14 and verse 8, it says that Lystra, a man was sitting who had no strength in his feet, lame from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul as he spoke, who, when he had fixed his gaze on him and had seen that he had faith to be made well, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet. And he leaped up and began to walk. All right, so here's the story of this lame man who never had walked before. Can you imagine that? Not ever knowing what it means to take steps. Um, that, that, that had to be a, a very difficult thing, especially for uh, a man in, in that particular culture where uh, you're all about working and you're all about providing and things like that. Um, it would have been a great challenge for this person. Always having to depend on other people. Well, he's there in the crowd while Paul is giving his gospel message. And Apostle Paul is kind of looking out in the crowd as he's teaching. And he sees this man and he sees something about him that this guy has the faith to be made well. And he tells him to stand upright on your feet. And he not only stands up, he leaps up uh, and begins to walk. This is a great and powerful miracle. It's done publicly where everyone could see it, well, which becomes important as we continue the story. Uh, but this is a fascinating miracle, and it's very similar to what we saw earlier in Acts when Peter did the same thing with the lame man at the beautiful gate, right? And that stirred up a whole lot of uh, things in Jerusalem. Same thing is happening here in Lystra. But... Nonetheless, there's this great miracle that's performed. This man that was lame was able to walk. Uh, we talked about before how this is kind of a picture of the gospel experience, right? We are all lame. <laughs> uh, spiritually speaking, we're all lame before God. We can't, we can't walk. We can't achieve. We can't work in our own strength. We depend upon the accomplished work of Christ to bring us into a position before God in which God makes us able to be able to stand before Him. Uh, but nonetheless, this is the miracle that's performed, and we'll see the response from the people uh, as they witness this great miracle. It says um, in verse 11, When the crowd saw that Paul had, what Paul had done, they raised their voice, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have become like men and have come down to us. And they began calling Barnabas Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. All right, so this is how they interpret the situation. They see this miracle and they're like, oh, the gods must be here. And uh, which shows that usually people interpret things based upon their own worldview and their own uh, presuppositions oftentimes. Uh, these people are already geared towards believing in these mythological gods, these Greek and Roman gods. And when they see a miracle perform, of course, their natural tendency is then to attribute it to one of those gods. I think sometimes we think, well, if only we had miracles, we could convert everybody. But even if you're performing a miracle, people are going to interpret that in different ways based on their own presuppositions. Um, a person who is a materialist who believes that the only thing that exists is the material world, if they see a miracle, all they're going to say is that, well, there's some scientific reason, but we haven't figured it out yet, but we will figure it out. And they'll push it to the future or, or they'll come up with some explanation 
Um, in other words, performing a miracle doesn't necessarily guarantee that someone's going to believe or, or believe the right things. Uh, some people might think, well, if only I saw this or if only God did this, then I would believe or, or other people would believe. It's not necessarily the case. Um, again, people see things through the lens of their own uh, presuppositions oftentimes. And so they see this man and immediately they think Zeus and Hermes have come. Now, Lystra was, um, or Zeus was seen as the patron of, uh, of Lystra in this area, okay? So they had, we'll see in a moment, they had a temple there for Zeus. Uh, that's why they immediately go to Zeus, because this is kind of what the god that they worshipped in that particular region. And there was also a, 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 a legend that had been passed down on multiple generations in this particular region that a few generations before this, actually quite a few generations before this particular event, that it was said that uh, Zeus and Hermes actually visited that area. And that when they came and visited that area, that only, everybody missed it. Only an elderly couple had recognized that Zeus and Hermes had actually visited the area. And it's believed that perhaps that's why they're so quick to say that Paul and Barnabas are Zeus and Hermes because they don't want to miss them again. They don't want to miss if Zeus and Hermes is coming again. They don't want to be the ones that miss out and to overlook the fact that they come. And so um, the theory goes is that perhaps that's what made them so ready to assign uh, those titles to Paul and Barnabas. Um, we're told in the text that they called uh, Barnabas Zeus and then they called Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. So uh, in Greek mythology, Hermes is the one who goes out and gives all the messages for all the gods, the Greek gods. He's also called uh, Mercury. He's the same as the Roman god Mercury. Uh, but uh, so Paul was seen as Hermes because he's the one that's getting up and speaking and giving the message and things like that. And then it's believed maybe Barnabas was called Zeus because of his personal presence. Uh, perhaps he exuded some type of commanding presence. Of course, it's all speculation, but uh, it's possible. For whatever reason, they assign them the titles of these gods and say that these are the gods. They have come like men and have come down to us. And it says in verse 12, and they began calling Barnabas. Oh, I already read that. Uh, verse 13, the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. All right, so the, the, the priest of Zeus now, he's coming, he's bringing sacrifices and garlands and things, and he wants to sacrifice to them, which was a very common thing uh, when it came to the Greek gods. You read the Iliad by Homer. Uh, you, you can see as you read through there, you know, they're offering up sacrifices to seek the favor and the help of the gods. That's, that's just what you would do. Um, and they're in line with that. They're saying, okay, if Zeus and Hermes are here, let's offer up sacrifices. Let's seek their favor, their help in, our, in this particular situation. Uh, and they had the priest of Zeus out uh, doing that very thing. And before we go further, I want you to think about what a temptation this must have been for Paul and Barnabas. Uh, remember where we left them off last week uh, in Iconium, where they were fleeing for their lives, the... Authorities wanted to stone them, and they escaped by the skin of their teeth, and, they, and now they come to Lystra, and they have a complete opposite response, and now people are exalting them, exalting them to be like gods. Don't you think they would want to relish in that a little bit? Say, finally, at least we're getting some acknowledgement. At least people are uh, finally looking up to us instead of looking down on us. Uh, finally, people are at least wanting to offer sacrifices to us instead of stoning us. Think about the temptation that, 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 might, that might have been there. Not just for those reasons, just because that's a part of human nature. You know, we like to be uh, respected and looked up to and, and acknowledged. Uh, all of that playing together could have been a great temptation for Paul and Barnabas. We'll see in a moment that probably wasn't a temptation for them based on their response, but it could have been. Uh, and maybe for people who weren't as focused as they were, who didn't have a single... Um, focus in their lives, they might would have been carried away by this. This could have completely unraveled not only the first missionary journey, it could have unraveled all of, of Paul's missionary journeys. Had Paul said, hey, I kind of like this, and just said, you know, I'm going to stay here in Lystra. I'm going to play this, this uh, play to be this God, 
Everyone's going to treat me like a god, and life's going to be good. But we'll find that that was not the case, that Paul remained focused and was able to properly navigate this situation. One more thing before we move on. It's also interesting how the things that they're wanting to do for Paul and Barnabas and the things that they're saying about Paul and Barnabas are things that are actually should have been said about Jesus Christ and had, should have been done to God the Father. What did they say? They said, the gods have become like men, have come down to us. Isn't that exactly what Jesus did? God in the flesh, Emmanuel, God with us. He came down and dwelt in the flesh. And he's the one that should receive the honor and the glory and the worship, right? Well, then also they're offering up sacrifices to them, which it's only to God, God the Father, to whom sacrifices should be offered. And all through the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices to him. And the ultimate sacrifice, of course, was Jesus Christ. And not only that, but we offer up our bodies as a living sacrifice. Romans chapter 12 teaches us. But it's to God that we offer up our sacrifices. So it's interesting that all the things that should have been going to Christ in this situation, all the things that should have been going to God the Father, were being directed to Paul and Barnabas, uh, ironically. And of course, this, this uh, strikes them uh, wrong um, in a bad way. In verse 14, it says, But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their robes and rushed out into the crowd, crying out and saying, Men, why are you doing these things? We also... We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In the generations gone by, he permitted all nations to go their own ways. And yet he did not leave himself without witness and that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. All right, so Paul and Barnabas don't say, don't sit back and say, hey, this feels pretty good uh, to finally be honored and to you know, have prestige among these people. What do they do? They tear their garments. That was a, that's how the Jewish people, their custom was to tear their garments when they were in anguish. Uh, they're not only just overcoming some temptation and just kind of getting through it. They're actually like, they're moved emotionally by the situation to the point that they're in anguish over the fact that these people would be uh, calling them gods and offering up these sacrifices to them. So they tear their, their robes and they rushed out into the crowd. They didn't sit back and say, well, you know, let's enjoy it for a little while. This actually feels pretty good. Uh, in a few days, we'll get around to telling them the truth about the matter. And no, they tore their garments and they rushed out immediately and began crying out to the people. You can, you can tell that this is genuine. They're not just doing this, well, we know we're not supposed to be worshipped as God, so let's go out and tell the people. No, they're, this is coming from the depths of their heart. They do not want these people to worship them and offer sacrifices. So they're tearing their garments, they're rushing out there, they're crying out to the people, and they're going to give them reasons why this should not be taking place. And basically three reasons we can find in, in the text, in this little uh, sermonette that, uh, that they give of why they should not be worshipped. And this is a challenge for us as well. Because I think it's human nature for us to want to exalt people too much. Um, maybe we don't give them the status of God, but we might exalt an individual or a group of people to the point that they kind of begin to in, in, impede on God's territory, right? And this is true whether we're talking about religious figures, whether we're talking about athletes, uh, whether we're talking about politicians, can you think of any politicians that people tend to overexalt and almost make them uh, the savior of the world? You know, that type of thing happens all the time. Um, politicians, celebrities, um, all of these people that we think, oh, this is what it's all about. All the glamour, all the, all the gifts that perhaps they have, the talents that they have. And in our hearts and our minds, we begin to elevate these people as though they're not even human and if we're not careful they can begin to become too exalted in our lives and even begin to impede on God's territory in our hearts uh, we're, we're told to uh, worship the Lord our God and to and to love him with all of our heart soul mind and strength to give him our full devotion and if we're distracted by these other people that we're exalting then um, we're robbing glory from God 
So we got to be very careful. And, and the way that we can be careful in that, oh, and before I, I say that, I think there's a reason why this happens. I think that God has put that capacity with, within us to worship another individual or another being. I think we have that capacity with us and have always had that capacity. We have the capacity to worship. We have the capacity to exalt. And God has given that to us. Why? So that when Christ came, or even when God himself revealed himself in the Old Testament, and we talk about when Christ comes uh, in his incarnation, that we would have that capacity in our hearts to exalt him and to give him the glory and the honor that he deserves when he comes. The problem is, is when we take that capacity and we use it towards other things, uh, and it may not even be a, a people, it may be money, it might be power, it might be our career, it could be a lot of things, but we have that capacity to worship, we have that capacity to exalt others, we just got to be careful that we're using it and directing it in the right way uh, towards uh, the one who deserves it. But uh, nonetheless, so this can be a great temptation for everyone. This is not to sing out any group or any individual person. We all have this capacity to do this. We can all fall under this uh, temptation to exalt people too much. Um, especially nowadays, I'm, I'm rambling now, but you know, especially nowadays you get on YouTube and you have all these gurus and stuff and they can become kind of the person that you follow and they can be the person you model yourself after. We just have to always remember, we want to model ourselves after Christ. We want to exalt Christ. We want to have him. Uh, as the one that we fix our eyes on. So, as Paul is given this little sermon, we can see three reasons or three things that can help us in avoiding this temptation to exalt people too much, whether against a politician, an athlete, a celebrity, a religious figure, whoever it might be, a spouse, whoever it might be. Um, one thing that he says is that people are people. We're all we're all of the same nature. He says. Uh, men, why are you doing these things? We also, we are also men of the same nature as you. So that's one thing to remember. When you see that, when you go to a concert and you see that musician up there and, and they're singing beautifully or they're playing the guitar in a, in a way that just leaves you in awe, it's always important to remember that person is a human being just like I am. Talented, a lot more talented than I am, but at the same time, that person is a human being just like me. You know, that the saying goes, you know, they put their pants on one leg at a time just like everybody else. If they don't wear deodorant, they're going to stink just like everybody else. I mean, we're all human beings. We all have to share the same nature. And we got to be careful that we don't say, well, this celebrity is, is uh, you know, above being human. Or, or that athlete is so talented and so gifted that it's superhuman. He has superhuman abilities or something like that. Whatever we might do. Uh, remember that they're people just like you are people, just like you're a person. Uh, we're all in the same boat. We're all in the, of the same nature. Uh, the scriptures are very careful about this. Even the greatest historical figures in the scriptures are always kind of, uh, there's a balance always given with them. Whether you're talking about David, David's probably one of the most exalted people in scriptures. King David, um, what are we told about him? We're, we're, we're basically giving his dirty laundry. Uh, the things that he did with, uh, with Bathsheba. Also when he uh, ordered the census, which was against God's will at that point. Um, Moses, as great as he is. I mean, he's the one through whom the, the law had come. Uh, he had done great things. Parted the Red Sea, the ten plagues. God had done mighty things through him. But we see Moses striking the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Uh, taking the credit of the water coming out of the rock to himself instead of giving it to God. Um, time and time again, the scriptures give us great individuals, great characters to uh, inspire us in following the Lord. But we always have to remember even those individuals were just flesh and blood. And they had their own imperfections. They had their own challenges. And they weren't perfect, uh, just like we are not. And so it's very important for us to remember, you know, when we're... When we're tempted to exalt someone too much, to just remember they're people just like we're people. Um, the second thing is, is that this is a vain thing to do. It says, uh, we also are men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made he the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. All right, so he says, this is a, we were trying to get you away from these vain things. Vain things just means empty things. 
to worship these mythological gods was an empty pursuit, right? Because these gods were not real gods. Uh, these were things that uh, had come out of the imagination of man. They had made up these various gods. Um, they attributed them to various things that they saw in nature. And to worship those gods was vain because it didn't help them at all to worship them. The only thing that would benefit them was to worship the living God, right? So that's a, that's a vain pursuit. And the same thing is true with us, you know? No, no offense against um, Taylor Swift. She's, I, I think she, she has talents and stuff. But Taylor Swift isn't going to help you, isn't going to bring you into a... Uh, she's not going to bring you salvation. She's not, probably not going to help you pay your bills. She's probably not going to help you in your daily life. She's just a talented musician, artist, things like that. Um, Tom Brady isn't a person who's going to help you in the dark times of your life and who you can turn to to find a source of strength and, and help in a time of need. These people, we, need to, we can appreciate their talents, we can appreciate their abilities and their giftings, but it's vain to exalt them so high that they become what our lives are all about. And they become what we focus on instead of focusing on God. And so, we got to remember, anytime we exalt anybody or anything... Uh, to the status of God, or even use them to push God to the side, it's a vain pursuit, is the a, is a second point. And then the third point is that to exalt others is, is really a distraction from keeping us from serving the living God. Uh, it says, we preach to you the gospel that you should turn from the vain things to the living God. And then they give uh, basically two things that this God had done that should have led them in the direction of him instead of serving Hermes and Zeus and all these other gods. It says, Vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. And the generations gone by, he permitted all the nations to go their own ways, and yet he did not leave himself without witness, in that he did good and gave you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. So basically two things. He's the one that created everything, and he's the one who has provided for you all these years. Even though you're attributing your successful harvest to some other God, to some other being, it was God that was giving you your fruitful seasons in their times. And he's the one that created everything. So uh, you wouldn't even exist if it wasn't for him. And, and we could even throw in there that he's the living God, not a God uh, on pieces of paper or on stone or metal, but the living God who made all things and has provided for the human race ever since the beginning. And so he's saying there that he's given you the witness that he's been taking care of you, that he's created all things, uh, and therefore uh, he's the one that you should be worshiping. Um, Romans chapter 8, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and let's say in verse 18. Starting, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through the things which are made, so that they are without excuse. Uh, just another verse to kind of back up this idea that God has given us witness uh, of his existence, of the fact that he's not only lived at one time, but that he's still alive and active and providing for us. Um, um, that's another reason why they should have been worshiping uh, the true God. And then it says in verse 18, after all this, it says, Even saying these things with difficulty, they restrain the crowds from, from offering sacrifice to them. And that's true. Even though we might know all these things, we might know, uh, we might know that... Um, other people are just people like us. Even though we know uh, in our heart of hearts that it's vain to, to exalt someone too much, and we might even know that God's the living God. He's the reason we exist. He's the one that's providing for us, so he uh, should have our complete allegiance. Even then, it's kind of difficult sometimes, right? Even then, we might get off course. We might uh, be tempted to you know, want to watch uh, Dak, Pros uh, Dak, uh, excuse me, Dak Prescott you know, throw that winning touchdown instead of coming to worship the Lord. You know, we can always be making these decisions uh, that seem to indicate that maybe we're exalting people too much. And it can always be a temptation that can rob us from full allegiance to Christ and to God. 
And so sometimes even knowing these things, we, we're, it, with difficulty, we're restrained from exalting people too much. It's just a, it's a part of human nature. We tend to want to do that. Uh, but here we see, ultimately, how was it that Paul and Barnabas navigated through this whole situation, this whole fiasco? Well, they were focused on the gospel. What, did, what came out of Paul? Well, we presume it was Paul. Uh, what, did, what did Paul say? What are these things? Uh, we are the same. We are also men of the same nature as you and preach the gospel to you. See how he's even focused on the gospel when he's um, responding to the crowd and then wanting to worship him. Paul was all about the gospel. He recognized that all this that's going on with you guys trying to worship us is just distracting us from what we're trying to get you to do and get away from those vain things. We want you to accept the gospel and accept the, the living God and give your allegiance to him. And so again, they were focused on the gospel. They were focused on why they were there. And that helped them to not allow themselves to get distracted and pulled to the side, even when people wanted to exalt and worship them. But now things are going to turn uh, in verse 19, and pretty drastically. It says, But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Wow, what a contrast there. Now these Jews from Antioch, that's Antioch, the city that we had uh, studied, that he went through in his first missionary journey earlier, where he goes there and has immediate success, but then... These, author these religious authorities come up against him, and then they have to escape. And then also, uh, Iconium is the place that we talked about last week where the same thing happened. Uh, they wanted to stone them, and so Paul and Barnabas had to leave town. Well, they're coming after them. Um, uh, Antioch Pisidian, I think, was like 130 miles from Lystra, and then uh, Iconium was about 60 miles. So... They're not taking a jet airplane to get there. They're actually traveling across these difficult roads and um, who knows, riding on camels or whatever, going this long distance to persecute Paul and Barbara. They're not satisfied with the fact that they're out of the city. They're actually chasing them down and wanting to persecute them everywhere that they went. And they're the ones that instigate the crowds against Paul and he actually ends up getting stoned. Which brings us to a point that we've seen time and time again. Don't trust too much in people's opinion of you. Don't trust too much in the opinion of the crowds or the social climate of the day. It can change just like that. People will be looking up to you and thinking you're a great, the greatest person in the world, and then tomorrow uh, hate you to the bone. Uh, just remember that people are not trustworthy in their, in their care for you and their love for you oftentimes. Um, that sounds kind of cynical, but... I'm just saying, don't put your trust in that. Put your trust beyond that into God. Fix your eyes on Him and be focused on serving Him and your relationship with Him. And then as people's likes or dislikes of you fluctuate throughout your life, you won't be fluctuating with that. Uh, you'll still be fixed in your purpose and in your love for the Lord. Um, so they come and they instigate and they actually stone Paul. And drag him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Now, is Paul playing dead, or was he knocked unconscious because they're throwing stones at him? In all likelihood, it's the latter. Maybe underwent a coma or something, who knows. But he's, he's to the point where he looks dead. And it says in verse 20, While the disciples stood around him, he got up and entered the city. Now, these disciples that stood over him show great uh, commitment to Paul. Right, The fact that they're even there with him while he's laying on the ground um, and, and looking dead, um, they show their commitment to him and their commitment to the cause in doing that. And it might even be the case that Timothy is there among those disciples. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to Timothy, who became kind of like his son in the faith, kind of became his uh, protege. It says, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and suffering, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. So there, the Apostle Paul actually mentions these very cities that we're talking about. Now, these aren't, this particular case isn't the only time that they went through those cities, so you can't say for sure that Timothy was there. 
But it's very likely that Timothy was actually there among these disciples that were kind of standing around Paul uh, when he stood up from being stoned. But the most amazing thing here is that Paul gets up and does what? He goes back into the city that he just got stoned in. Uh, amazing. Uh, amazing the commitment. Now, to be fair, he could have been going back to seek medical attention or he might have been going back for some other reason. But the fact that he even considered that as an option uh, is commendable to him that he would do that. But even if we don't uh, say that he was going back, you know, because, you know, he was just wanting to serve more of God and the gospel and things. We can see that as we continue the story. So uh, he gets up and goes back into the city and then continuing in verse 20, it says, uh, the next day he went away with Barnabas to Derby. After they had preached the gospel in that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying, through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. All right, so they go to Derby, which was kind of in that same area as Lystra there in Galatia, so, uh, southern Galatia. But they go there, and they begin to preach, and they have a successful ministry there. But look where they go. It would have been very easy for them to go from uh, Derby straight to Antioch, kind of just take the, the coast, on down to Antioch, that is Antioch in Syria, not Antioch Pisidian. Uh, but they could have gone back to the church that they had uh, started at and avoided going back to all of these hostile cities. But look what they did. After preaching in Derby, they go back to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. Those are the very cities that these uh, guys were coming from who stoned Paul. That's just amazing to me. That's inspiring to me that he would do that. That he would go back, and that's probably why the message that he was giving the church was, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Because uh, they're probably like, Paul, what are you doing here? I mean, or I'm sure they were glad to see him, but they're probably like, this is very dangerous for you to be in this area. But Paul's saying, you know what, through many tribulations we enter the kingdom. It's just a part of the Christian life. To endure tribulations, afflictions, and things for the sake of the kingdom. It just goes along with the territory. And this is true whether you're being... You have stones being thrown at you, or people are ridiculing you, or speaking against you, or it's just a daily struggle, the daily grind of fighting against the flesh, fighting against temptation, fighting against your natural tendencies. Um, it can be manifested in a lot of different ways, but the main thing is that when you're serving the Lord, it's, it's difficult, it's challenging. Uh, it's through all those many challenges that we enter the kingdom of God. Now hear him talking about entering the kingdom of God, there's a sense in which we are presently in the kingdom of God. Um, when we come to faith in Christ, we are transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of his dear son. Colossians teaches us. Upon coming to Christ, we enter into the kingdom. But there's a sense in which in the future, there's going to be the full manifestation of the kingdom of God in the new heavens and new earth and the resurrection. Uh, and that may be what Paul's talking about here, or what's being spoken about here, that to enter into that state, we have to go through all these different tribulations and afflictions to get to that glorious end where we'll be living with God eternally, where there's no sickness, no crying, no death, and we'll live in bliss in the presence of God forever. But to get there, you've got to go through this little season of, of affliction and tribulation. And then in verse 23, it says, When they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. So, that was the other purpose for going back to those cities. Yes, to encourage them and strengthen them, but also to set them up so that they could um, continue in the future. To have these elders that could lead them and instruct them and keep them on track, even though Paul and Barnabas would not physically be there. Um, and so they, they appoint these elders, they pray with them, with fasting. Again, we see this prayer and fasting being tied together. We saw it in chapter 13 when they launched out into this first missionary journey, it was done with prayer and fasting. Uh, we see that happening again. Those two things are linked uh, very closely in the New Testament. Uh, but they commend them to the Lord in whom they believe. And then verse 24, they pass through Pisidia. Okay, so now they're, they're heading back. They're looping back down around, going the same way that they went. And Luke just quickly goes through that. He says, they passed through Pisidia and came into Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Atilia. 
From there they sailed to Antioch, from which they had been committed to the grace of the work of um, the work that they had accomplished. When they had arrived and gathered the church together, they began to report all things that God had done with them, and how He had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they sent, and they spent a long time with the disciples. So they make it back to Antioch, not Antioch Pisidian, uh, but the Antioch in Syria, the original church, that missionary church that they had come out from. But we see here, uh, Paul and Barnabas who stayed committed through everything. As we conclude this first missionary journey, that's the, the one thing, if you could find one thing that we see as exemplified by Paul and Barnabas in this whole missionary journey, was that they were committed to God and to the work that God had given them, no matter the circumstances. Whether they had a good reception, whether they were exalted, whether they were stoned, whether they were chased after... They stay committed. And the question is, are we that committed? Do we have a single purpose in our lives? Or are we bouncing off a thousand different directions? Are we really focused? Do we follow what the Hebrew writer teaches us in Hebrews chapter 12, uh, where he says, Therefore, since we have so, gra so great a cloud of witnesses, and Paul could be included among those witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Sundays are great because it helps us to get refocused again. When, when our thoughts and our minds and our desires start drifting away and going in all different directions, this is a time in which we can redirect, refocus, and to remember why we're truly here and begin to walk in the direction the Lord would have us to go. So that's our message this morning. I appreciate your kind attention. Uh, if you're here this morning and you want to give your life to Christ, you want to find that purpose in life that you can chase after, that you can follow uh, even to the end where there's glory awaiting you, we encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing the song that Dylan has prepared.